UEFA Champions League round of 16 second leg action continued on Tuesday with two more matches in a game carried live on Sportsmax 2. Manchester City welcomed RB Leipzig to the Etihad Stadium following their 1-1 draw in the first leg. Let's have a look at these seven goal highlights. Grealish has gone high with it. Rodri's got it down. Akanji couldn't finish. Stones. Haaland. Oh. Back in for Akanji. He couldn't finish again. How's it going to move when you leave the floor? Rodri head. That's, that is not a penalty in my book. Well, the Spanish VAR Alejandro Hernandez has asked Slavko Vincic to look. And he says it is. He says the hand was out in an unnatural position, making the block. When you jump up in the air... Your arm, look where Rodri's arms are. They're out, they're out wide whilst he's off the floor. It's Erling Haaland for Manchester City. And he scored to give City the advantage in the tie. For a split second until you see that ball nestle in the corner. It's perfectly placed. 35 in a Manchester City shirt in his first season wearing one. And that's what it was for. It perplexed pretty much everybody. You know, looking at that angle, I'm not even sure it put his arm below the T-shirt line, which is the usual measure. Yeah. But, but the officials go. thought it did. And City go again. It's De Bruyne! Oh! It's Haaland and it's two! Well, he's, he's done the right thing in all fairness to him. He's got rid of it. De Bruyne does fantastic there to take that shot. This time it is clear, and Dominic's a boss light with a lovely swerve away from De Bruyne. And that's a good ball, too. Where's Edison going? Oh, oh Edison's fouled, hasn't he? Surely, the referee says no. And he's going to give a yellow card to Timo Werner. So, you haven't, you've only got to look at the way that the ball moved and where it went. That's usually what referees try and pick up. So here comes the goalkeeper. Timo Werner definitely what? gets there first. How much contact? It's not, it's not Timo it's Werner. That he's it's Lima. And Werner gets a yellow card for speaking his mind, as you'd think he might. Well, Rodri's made a mistake now. Oh! oh. And if our match director will get tight into the referee's eyes at some point. Oh, play quickly. There's Gundogan. That's a good save. He's responded with a sparkling first half tonight. In towards Ruben Diaz. And it's into the net again. Who got the last touch? It's 3-0 City. Right on the cusp of half-time. <laughs> Incredible. It rolled right along the line. It's unlucky again for Leipzig. And then as Haidara turned to clear it, look who's there. He's always there. Haaland to Gundogan. Grealish wants it. Grealish back to the captain, Gundogan. Gundogan with space to shoot, and it's four. Which way is he going to go, outside or in? Back to Gundogan, a little shimmy onto the left foot. Bernardo Silva all the time in the world. Up goes Haaland, and there's a Kanji and Haaland again! <laughs> and he's having that sort of night, isn't he? Look how high he leaps there. Incredible jump. But he's just having that night, but look, everything's dropping for him. Look, on his left foot, on the half ball, it's only... Mahrez. Blasvic with another save. Haaland with another goal! I think he's even amazed himself at the way that this ball... It's almost drawn to him. It's like a magnet, look. De Bruyne. He deserves a goal. And De Bruyne oh. has got a goal! Wow. Pulled all of the strings. City 7, Leipzig 0. It equals their record ever home win in the Champions League. And they've saved the best one till last. How about that? For accuracy. Soon as he hits that, he knows that is going in. Well, Pep Guardiola called at the weekend for this stadium to live one of the best nights we have lived. They were his words. Erling Haaland has had the best night of his career to date.
Yeah, seven goals to nil. Manchester City winning that. Ex Trinidad and Tobago International Brent Sancho joins us now. Brent, uh, now a pundit and club owner. Brent, welcome to the Sports Max Zone. Um, <laughs> let, let, let me start here though, because Manchester City were as good today as referee Slavko Vincic was bad, <laughs> I thought. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. I think obviously uh, goals one, two, and three uh, certainly set up the rest. Uh, of the goal scoring spree that Manchester City went on. Uh, certainly not a penalty in, in my view. Um, I, I think the ball uh, played to hand. Uh, the player was hit the ball, hit the player, it was way too close. He, he didn't get any opportunity to, to move his hand. And uh, of course, uh, I, I think the se second goal, a mistake, maybe even a foul in the build up by Haaland. Uh, and uh, it went on to be goal number two, a mistake by Leipzig playing out to the back. Uh, and I think from there on in, they, 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 they kind of rode their luck. Um, they, well, they, they rode their luck in those first three goals and then went on to score more goals. But I think from a Haaland perspective, Lance, it's good. It's good in that sense. And that play in particular, I just mentioned, I thought that may have been a foul by Haaland. But anyway, he went on to score. But I think from a Haaland Manchester City perspective, it's really good. Particularly this time of the season where they're chasing Arsenal and, of course, chasing the Champions League. Yeah, I, I have to... You know, my heart goes out to Leipzig, though, because as you just mentioned, the early goals were contentious and to concede two goals in the space of two minutes in the middle of the first half would have been deflating for any team. Yeah, and, and, and I think when you look at it, it they, they do have a point to argue. Uh, of course, the first one to me is, is, is certainly not a penalty. I, I would, of course, like to hear reviews from, from different uh, referee and outlets uh, as to what they think, but I, I am very sure that's not a penalty. Uh, as we can see here, I just don't understand where they expect the player to move his hand. The, he's already jumped, the ball's gone past him, uh, and the ball's headed onto his hand. I, I don't know where he's expected to move his hand. That could never be a penalty. Then, and I certainly don't understand the rules of the sport if that's the case. But I'm, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure, Brent, if that ball touched his hand. To be honest. Well, that, that's the next thing. I think we, we looked at the, probably about two or three angles from VAR as it relates to it. Uh, and it looked more that the ball may have passed. It, it's, not, it's not conclusive uh, whether or not it, it hits his hand. And, and then the second goal, the bit of after, is, of course, as we see the referee goes over to the, the monitor, normally nine times out of ten we know what that means. But, I mean, to call that back, I, I mean, come on, I, I don't get what they would have seen. Uh, buying the fact that let's, let's argue that it did hit the hand, where is he supposed to put his hand? <laughs> yeah, Brent, it was instructive to me that none of the Manchester City players even appealed for a penalty, which for me said quite a lot. But given your, your experience, Brent, um, in this game called football, can you even hazard a guess as to what the VAR officials would have been thinking and what the referee would have seen that would lead him to the decision that he made to award the penalty? Well, initially the referee didn't see anything. The VAR did, as you rightfully mentioned. And the only thing I can suggest is that they would say that his hand was not in a natural position. Now, the fact of the matter is we've seen many times over the season, whether it be Champions League, EPL, La Liga, etc., where if a ball is played onto a hand in terms of uh, close proximity, it normally is not given because the argument is whether it's in an unnatural position or not, the player doesn't have enough time to move his hand. This is very strange and, 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 and I agree with you. I, I, I'm not sure what VAR saw. I, I think once the referee went over to the monitor, I think he was almost convinced by VAR that that has to be the right position and this is a perfect look at it I, I don't know what they expect the player to do with his arm the ball's gone the, the, the player headed it onto him uh, and, and then now the argument ricardo would start to be well how close is close is it is it that the player has to be right up under another player to receive a shot or a header on the hand I, I'm, I'm i'm baffled yeah, I'm buffered as well, but again, I'm just saying the Manchester City players did not even appeal. They went about with their normal business. They seemed quite okay. And then, of course, VAR called the play back. So there we go. How much do you think that impacted the Leipzig team? Because it could potentially have been a game changer. It was nil all at that stage, 20 minutes in. Um, the game was 
playing out, I think, in the way that we would have expected it based on what we saw in the second, in the first leg. Yeah, I agree with you. And how many times we've seen in football where a decision like that uh, follows up by a, a, another uh, a goal that they should not have conceded? And I think in particular, Ricardo, those two goals that they would have conceded over that very, very short space of time would have deflated the life seg. We, we would have seen the, 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 the high press, uh, the energy levels, even the belief that they had coming into the Etihad was gone. Uh, and I think the game became a foregone conclusion after then. It's, it's very difficult to go two goals behind to Manchester City at the Etihad. And, and I think that's what Leipzig players and management felt. Yeah, um, or enough of that though, because that to me was the, the headline story of the game, the contentious issues during the game. But beyond that, Manchester City looking smooth and almost flawless and six consecutive quarterfinal spot here now for them, which is normal, par for the course for Manchester City in UEFA Champions League football. Obviously, quarterfinals isn't their target. Mm -hmm. um, we've said this before, Brent. But we have to revisit the discussion about Pep Guardiola and his inability up to this point to bring home the Champions League title for Man City um, since he's been there, albeit with you know, so many other titles, titles there. But is this the year? Is this the year that City will do it? I, I don't. I, yes, I think they're one of the contenders, certainly one of the favorites, but they're not the only favorite. Uh, certainly when you look at the competition, you would have to speak about Real Madrid. You'd have to have a conversation about Bayern Munich, etc. Uh, they certainly have not uh, put themselves above everyone else that we can sit here right now and suggest that, look, these, these guys are the favorites to win. I don't think so. Uh, what I do think, however, Lance, is that they have a, a, in a player Haaland that's someone that could win you a championship. I don't think Pep had that necessarily uh, in his tenure at Manchester City. Haaland now is starting to look like a player that is has almost fully integrated into the way City plays, the way he wants to play, and they both seemingly started to find a, a working, loving relationship. Uh, and I, I feel that once this, the season goes on, it's only going to improve. The question is, uh, is it enough to win a Champions League? I may think so. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how much this relationships continue to build, but it's certainly getting better and better by every game. Yeah, and the fact is that the roster and the tools uh, that uh, Guardiola has to work with still impressive when you see Foden doesn't start again and you have players of that quality as an option to come off the bench. Uh, we, you, you certainly have to think that from a tools perspective, an equipment perspective, uh, human resources we're talking about, <laughs> that Guardiola has, has what it takes on the field. Uh -uh. Yeah, look, how many times we've seen this tournament and a team, and, and a, a, very easy for an example here, Real Madrid, that probably has a very poor season leading into December, January, February, and all of a sudden, because of their depth, because of the quality, because of the tools, they're able to peak at the right time. And I think that's what City has. Yes, they're chasing Arsenal, uh, of course, for the EPL title, but they're chasing Arsenal with a very big squad, a squad that has a lot of depth, that has a lot of quality, and that has a lot of capabilities. Uh, and as I said before, you throw that in the mix with a team that... And you have to also mention, Lance, this is an experienced bunch. This is a bunch that would have been knocked out uh, and felt uh, a finals defeat. This is a bunch that would have felt a uh, defeat in the latter round. So they are experienced. They're not coming into this uh, all shine eye and bushy tail. They have experience in this competition. So you add those factors in it, and you have to suggest that this might just be the year for Pep Guardiola. Yeah, and you get the impression as well, Brent, that... And I guess this is always going to be the case, especially at Manchester City, where the depth is there and you're not always sure whether you're going to get the playing time that you desire. But talk to me about Kevin De Bruyne, because I watched him today, especially in the latter stages of that match. And I just got the impression that maybe he was trying to prove a point. Of course, it led to a goal at the end of it. But what did you make of this superstar? Uh, listen, I, I, I don't think... Ricardo, there's any manager in any sport probably that is a good a motivator as motivator as Pep Guardiola is. To do what he's doing consistently, being successful, winning games, keeping players hungry. One of the toughest jobs in world football is to keep a team hungry, a team that has won a championship, whether it be a league, a cup or whatever. But to see them play at the same levels every single season, demanding for players every year, 
uh, it's a very difficult thing to do as a manager. Kevin De Bruyne had a little bit of a blip in his performances and Pep Guardiola challenged him. Nine times out of ten, when a player has been around the manager for that period of time, that could normally go negative and the player could always opt out or decide that he's not being, he's not born because he's won everything before. But there you are, and he rightfully said, Kevin De Bruyne wanted to put in a performance today because of what was said to, about him leading up to the game. And again, that goes down to terrific man management. And Pep Guardiola, as I said, is one of the best in sports at it. Well, let's hear what Pep Guardiola had to say after that 7-0 for his team. I know it seems a simple, maybe simplistic thing to say. Is that something or someone you've missed in this competition in the last two or three years? Someone that in those moments is almost a guarantee? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Mm. The reason why we could see the, a lot of goals, we give them the open. So, because we score four goals here to Real Madrid, we scored years ago six goals against Monaco, we scored four goals here against Tottenham, and all the time we were out. Because we could see the goals, we could be absolutely worth it. And right now, these, back, these guys, John, and, and you know, uh, they defend really well. So, we, we didn't. They are defenders, and that's why, that's why, because goals always we have a score all the time in in all the seasons. But of course, have a weapon like Erling or Julian, like is like we had with Sergio before, mm. or Gabriel, that uh, have this instinct to score goals. Uh, of course, in this competition, in one moment he can score is important. And did you? Yeah, the brilliant man manager, as uh, Brent put it. Pep Guardiola ahead of the game saying that Kevin De Bruyne needed to focus on the simple things. The goal that he scored, not simple at all. It was a fabulous goal and Manchester City through to the quarterfinals of the UEFA Champions League now and they have to be delighted with that performance today despite the controversies early including that opening goal and we'll continue that debate as to whether it was a penalty or not will not change now Manchester City they are through um, Erling Haaland his well five goals in this contest joining Lionel Messi as players to have scored five goals in a UEFA Champions League match um, both would have been coached by Pep Guardiola as well so there's another feather in the cap of uh, Guardiola um, and now the big question can City go on and win the UEFA Champions League under the guidance of Guardiola and we'll be saying at last at last at last Lance if they can go on and do it <laughs> you know I, I, I wanted to, to put to Brent quickly the fact that part of the reason why some analysts where their take on Pep not winning the UEFA Champions League is that he tinkers with his mm. team too much I saw him in the first leg go through with a I think it was a 4-2-3-1 formation. Yeah. Today he went 4-1-4-1. So Brent, just before we leave the Pep Guardiola and Manchester City exploit today, um, the, the issue of Pep Guardiola's tactical approach to games, um, do you think with his obvious strong desire to win the Champions League that he will this year be a little bit more measured and consistent with his, his tactics and not, you know, tweet too much? Uh, that's a very good question, Lance. And, and I, I think the simplest way to answer it is the fact that Pep, there are two types of managers in my books. One, yes. a manager that plays to win a football game and a manager that plays not to not to lose. Yes. Uh, and I think Pep is a manager that plays to win. And when a manager plays to win, he will always try to look at things from a tactical perspective that will help him win. Whether it's, it's not playing with a, a holding midfielder in one of the, 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 the Champions League finals a couple of seasons ago, or, or making uh, selection decisions that may baffle us. Uh, so to answer your question, I think at the end of the day, don't be surprised if he does tinker, because that's the type of person and the type of manager he is. He tinkers because he wants to have a tactical advantage against any football team. It's what's made him great but it's also his Achilles heel as well. Mm. Yeah, Brent, just quickly, just following up on, on, on that question from Lance, your thoughts on the back line put out there by Guardiola today, Akanji Diaz, um, Nathan Ake, and then you had John Stones, essentially um, four centre-backs. 
Yeah, four centre backs, and, and he's comfortable. I think what he's saying, and you, you heard him in the, in the press conference, he, he wants to be able to defend at the same point in time. Yes, he is a ball about controlling possession, but he also wants to not be hit in transition and a counter. And he believes if he has uh, that sort of, because he doesn't ask his, his wing backs to play very high up the park or to overlap. He asks them, of course, to build out of the back into the midfield. So I think he's safe in playing that way. And, and maybe why, I mean, a lot of people scratch their head when Cancelo went to Bayern Munich. I, I, I did as well. But when you really think about it, he's the type of manager that wants defenders that can defend. He's, he's learned from that. He's been harping on that for, for, for a very long time. Yes, he's happy with the goals being scored, but he's always concerned about conceding goals. Yeah, Brent, stay right there because we are continuing to talk about the UEFA Champions League. After the break, we go to the Porto Inter game as well as a quick look at what happens on Wednesday. Back with more on The Zone after this. Stay with Sportsmax on YouTube and follow us on all social pages for updates, news and entertainment. <laughs> 